let's review together what we learned in this chapter regarding iMeets. So first, we looked at how we can create iMeets inside of components. We started with a very simple example with a rivet, and we saw how easy it was to create corresponding insert mates inside of the step and the rivet so those two components could come together very quickly and efficiently. Then we learned how to use iMates when inserting components into assemblies. We looked at how you can move between multiple matching iMates if multiple iMate matches exist within an assembly. And we saw how you could use the place at all matching iMates command to quickly put things like screws, bolts, rivets, nuts, to quickly put those everywhere inside of your assembly very quickly. Then we learned how composite iMates can be very useful when we want to mate two parts together that require more than one constraint. We can create these composite iMates that make it very quick and efficient to put our parts together. And then finally, we learned how we can infer iMates from both existing features as well as constraints that already exist with inside of our assemblies. Now, there are a few important rules that we should go over real quick regarding iMates. First of all, iMate definitions are saved inside of the part and component files. They must match in order to join together. So even if you have two offset constraints that you want to join together, if those numbers don't match, Inventor will consider that not to be a match, even if they have the same name. So it's important that not only the names match, but also that the information matches within it as well. In addition, iMates cannot be edited if they are part of a composite iMate. If you want to edit it, you first need to remove it from the composite iMate, edit it, then recombine it and remake that composite iMate. We also learned that we can infer iMates from features only with circular edges. That's all that's supported from the inferring iMates perspective. And in addition, it's important to know that once you use an iMate, it becomes consumed and is no longer available for additional parts to be mated to it. So for example, in that front assembly, there are four different steps that are all mated to it the same way. In the front assembly, we have to create four different composite iMates, one for each step, if we want to be able to put four steps in there together. Now, regarding best practices, really we should use on parts that you want to constrain to multiple instances inside of an assembly. So again, think of a rivet, think of a bolt, think of our stair assembly, where we wanted to place multiple steps or multiple rivets In those instances, it really made sense to turn those into iMates. Another important use of iMates is if you want to document how your parts are intended to go together. So if you have, for example, a motor mount, by creating an iMate, you could very effectively communicate to an end user how the mounting situation goes. So this is also a very good documentation tool on how you want parts to go together. In addition, iMates is a really nice way that you can use for replace components. If you're inside of an assembly and you want to replace one component with another one, if they weren't created with the exact same reference geometry, oftentimes your mates will fail. But if you use iMates and they're set up to be the same way, you can seamlessly replace components from one to another if they both have the same iMate inside of them. And then finally, one of the best practices is use consistent naming and definition when you're creating these, because that way you make it easier for an inventor to recognize where there should be matches and you help it recognize where there shouldn't be matches.